welcome to Events Demystified Podcast, where we explore and demystify the world of in-person, virtual, hybrid event AV production and technology by sharing insightful tips, tricks and tactics to make your events a success. This podcast is brought to you by Tree Fan Events, a woman-owned boutique event production agency. And your host is Anka Trafan, a technical event planner and producer with almost two decades of hands-on technical experience in event production. Well, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the event about it, the podcast series where we dive into some of the funnest, also toughest event (laughs) stories as, as they are shared with us by the events community. I'm your host, Anka Platantrifan, and with me, I have my wonderful co-host, Megan Martin. Hello, Megan. How are you? Good to see you today, and a big congratulations on your nomination for Entrepreneur Woman of the Year, whatever the name of it was. How was Seattle? Did you have a great trip? It was fantastic. We decided to make it this road trip, honestly. So it was a long drive. Luckily, I always have things to do on those long drives. So I I never get bored. The kids are great travelers. So it was fun. My husband literally made it in record time because we left on Friday right after our live taping of our episode. And I just got in the car. It's like, let's drive because I wanted to take any time (laughs) for the gala that was happening that night so that was super fun with that i'm super excited that we got to actually do two live recordings of event about it and i wanted to extend a huge thank you to everyone that has joined those episodes and provided feedback engaged with us also everyone that shared some of their stories with us and uh, i really think that made those uh, episodes really special what do you think megan They were really special. Sometimes it can be intimidating when you're jumping on to share the things that went wrong at your event. That can feel really scary. So it was really great to hear all the stories and really the chat on both live episodes were electric is probably the best word for it. I mean, contributing, sharing, and honestly validating a lot of the things we were saying. And it feels a little less scary to share the stuff that goes wrong when people are like, oh yeah, I've been there. I get it. Like we all know. So thank you to our guests that were with us and also everyone in the chat. I mean, you guys made it that much more fun. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you something. What, which, which part was it your favorite? Like which episode? Uh, and we won't tell our feature guests <laughs> <laughs> if one was more favorite than the other. I'm curious if you had one that you felt like we really covered some really cool stories or maybe the engagement was really high or maybe the stories were just like over the top. Do you have a favorite? I have Two tied for favorites for different reasons. One was the story that David told about stealing the table. Like we kind of took a hard left turn in that conversation where we were really talking about security protocols and things like that. So I think there was a lot of great takeaways from a very funny story of people literally putting a table in their coat and their pants to walk out of the event. So, I mean, hilarious, but also some strong takeaways there. But man, my heart just went out to John for having to do an event for four days with no power. I mean, clearly everyone there made the most of it and they really enjoyed their time together and used it as a chance to unplug. But man, I I would be sweating bullets. John's a good friend of mine and I am just continually amazed at his composure because I can't say I would have kept it together for that long with flashlights and candles for four days. I mean, that's Absolutely. Yeah. What about you? Did you have a favorite? Yeah, that definitely would have stopped anyone in their tracks if you think about like yeah. how impromptu that was, you know, without any prior preparation or heads up or, hey, by the way, there might be, you know, the possibility of the power going out. <laughs> right. um, I, yeah, I I agree with you. That story was a lot. And as far as a favorite, I do like funny stories. I I won't lie. (laughs) If there's a story that after the fact, you can turn it around and see the silver lining and then laugh at yourself or at the situation or whatever that might have caused the problem, I'm all for that. Because I feel like 
you also learn better when you're in that mindset, a more of a positive mindset versus something that's as traumatic as going without, you know, food, water, all the basic life necessities. <laughs> That to me, you know, sounds like, yes, there's a lot of good learnings and there's obviously everyone that made it through uh, their troopers, but it almost sounds like you're borderline on the PTSD. <laughs> uh, yes. I can only imagine what John's like survival kit, event survival kit looks like now. I mean, there's probably flashlights and batteries and candles and all kinds of things in it that most people probably wouldn't have because of the PTSD from that. Exactly, like he would open his, you know, event uh, survival toolbox and it would be like, what is wrong with you? It's like, lesson learned. You, yeah, will, exactly. you leave and learn, right? So it's like, trust me, this is all necessary. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. Well, also what I really liked was some of the stories that were shared in the chat. I mean, I honestly didn't necessarily expect everyone to be so open because as you said yeah. earlier, you know, sometimes going back and sharing some of those stories, it might not necessarily reflect either all the great on the event or the organizers or even yourself sometimes, right? So having the ability to look not just, you know, subjectively, but objectively at the situation and be able to say, hey, this happened and then this is what we learned. To me, that is such a growth mindset type of way of looking at the situation. So there are quite a few stories that were shared. If you did miss our live episodes, the comments are still very much alive and well <laughs> on LinkedIn, especially. So do go back and check those out. I mean, there's a lot of learnings in the comments yeah. aside from the episode itself. So sometimes, you know, like you, when you join a really nice, good event um, a lot of the action actually does happen in the comments so <laughs> when yeah, I go sure. back to watch an event I always go in the comments because I always know it's like I miss something most likely it's somewhat revealed you know in the comment section so if you did miss that those episodes go back there and uh, check it out for yourself we will cover one of those stories today and I'm excited to get into two of the stories that will go and dissect and demystify and unpack in our best way possible and then see what comes out of it. What do you say? Let's go. All right. So our first story today was sent in by Brad Montgomery, a corporate speaker, 30 years of experience. Wow. Brad's been talking for a long time. I actually think I might've seen Brad at an event once or twice. Potentially. Oh. So here's Brad's story. My biggest frustration at conferences isn't the audience or the meeting planners. It's the audiovisual setup. My requirements are simple. I just need a computer hookup on the stage that I can easily access. Yet the number of times this gets messed up is shocking. My client thinks it's straightforward. The venue agrees, but when I arrive on site, it's a different story. The AV team often hasn't communicated my needs properly, and I end up on stage without the setup I need. For example, I can't have my computer in the booth. My presentation requires me to be flexible and responsive to the audience, adjusting on the fly. If my computer's in the back, it disrupts the flow completely. I can't keep the audience to hold on while I skip irrelevant slides. Even in 2024, I still encounter issues with my Mac not being tested, leading to last minute panics. Ooh, never been. This creates tension with the AV team. I'm always polite but firm about my needs. Unfortunately, this sometimes makes my client wonder if I'm being difficult, which isn't good for anyone. Completely agree. Another problem is timing. Sometimes the AV check is just an hour and a half before my keynote, but they open the doors 30 minutes before, leaving me scrambling. If things aren't set up correctly, I have to decide at the last minute whether to go with or without slides or audio, which is incredibly stressful. The core issue is that my simple requests often don't get communicated to the person setting up the room, causing unnecessary conflicts and stress right before I'm supposed to perform. What are your thoughts on the situation? You being an AV expert far more than I am, I'm curious on your thoughts because I have a few things and there were a few nuggets of this that 
kind of guided my thought process. But I'll start with you. What do you think? All right. Well, first off, to Brad's comment, the premise that he started, I'm happy, Brad, that your biggest frustration frustration is not the audience, because that would make for a very unhappy audience. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> if you were the speaker. So that's good that we set the record straight. And I can, you know, I can, I'll empathize with the situation. Actually, as a speaker myself, and many times, you know, waltzing in with a Mac, which for some reason, there is always a bit of an issue connecting it to, you know, the projector, or then you need some kind of a converter, or if you don't need a converter, you need some type of a AV box that will support the scaling, a scaler some, of some sort. There's always a bit of a unknown and I, you know, again, I always like to come prepared and test it. I would even bring my mini ATEM just to make sure that whatever I need is ready to go. I feel like there is opportunity to either over communicate when it comes to your situation. And if you're the one that, you know, feels like you need to explain the situation in plain terms, this is what normally I run into. And this is the reason why I like to make sure that this one adapter that I need is there. I would always uh, advise to do that. I actually have this conversation with meeting planners or event planners that I get to, you know, be hired by and go to their events. And I tell them from my experience, this is what there's one piece of equipment that is necessary when I bring my Mac and I send them the link and I, you know, I ask them to talk to the AV lead to make sure that they have it. And if they don't have it, I honestly bring my own. I mean, at this point, if you've done this for so many years, you're just going to have your own toolbox of little adapters and little things that will make your life easier because yeah. Otherwise, you're relying again and again on the AV team to understand your need, but also to uh, make it happen. And they might or they might not. They might just think, as he said, that you're just a super, you know, drama <laughs> queen and you're fine. Being like, difficult. Yeah, you're not any different than any of the other speakers. So why would we, you know, just give you more, you know, attention or whatever, which is not a good attitude to begin with, but I know that could happen. It's the back talk behind the scenes that many times, you know, gets amplified. So to his point, to his frustration, if I were to be in his shoes again and again, running the same issue, I would just be so prepared that there would be no opportunity to have the same issue happening again. I mean, it happened once, it happened again. How many times does it have to happen for me to actually learn my lesson, right? So I'm not sure if that's an op option for you, Brad, but um, I have done this in the past where I brought my decimeter and my EV converter and my, even like my, like I said, uh, my eight and mini problem when I needed to switch in between laptops. I had two laptops and my switcher and a podio. I mean, super overkill, right? No speaker just comes with all their AV set up like that, but I knew <laughs> what I needed. And I also knew that I can always rely on, especially some uh, in-house AV teams, they might not have all this equipment sitting around because they're either overly booked or understaffed or who knows what the situation might be, right? So if you would talk to someone five months ago and they said, oh yeah, yeah, no problem, we'll have that. And then here comes the day of, you know, of your keynote and you show up 30 minutes before doors and you realize that they don't have it. I mean, how many times would it take for you to just be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go to Amazon and buy myself a decimeter and this converter and that converter and I just hook it on myself. Because by now, probably you got to be enough literate to know what you need to make your setup successful. So those are my thoughts right off the bat. And then there's more to say about the AV team being, you know, proactive and sure. um, just being available and ready to support the speaker's needs. Because, you know, if you're a breakout speaker, most likely you're just going to have to do with what's there. If you're a keynote right. speaker, there's a lot more in the setup that um, is happening. And there's also this, you know, I've honestly on both sides as a keynote, but also as, you know, a um, AV uh, technician or whatever video uh, operator, 
nobody likes a bunch of wires at the podium if you're in the main ballroom and you're the keynote. Like people want to see a clear, nice podium and you have the clicker in your hand and you're going to present with the you know, laptop in the back. So if your setup is not conducive to that type of, you know, kind of situation, more communication is needed or, I mean, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> I mean, it's the biggest takeaway I took. I mean, I don't speak nearly as frequently as you do, but I have a kit that I travel with that is every dongle, every charger, every connection to connection possible because I also use a Mac and I know not everyone's going to have those things. So I literally have like a fold out kit of like every cord possible. Yeah. But my biggest takeaway from this was when Brad mentioned that he was a keynote speaker because right. All rules are off the table when you introduce keynote. As you said, breakout is breakout. Generally, yeah. they can be a little more flexible. There's going to more than likely be a computer at the podium in a breakout room, but a keynote is not. And nine times out of 10, those podiums are ordered in. They're nicer. A lot of times they're clear or plexiglass exactly. or something, and they don't want a computer at the front. And so... Nine out of 10 times I'm on Brad's side here, but when you're a keynote speaker, a lot of times you need to be asking for a rehearsal the day before. If you're waiting yes. till the day of, it's a little too late because of doors opening early. You can't, especially with the keynote, there's not a lot of changes that can be made day of. We can exactly. make small tweaks to run a show, graphics, whatever. But if we're having to rerun cords, reroute confidence monitors, all of this just for your keynote, when there's... A dozen other things going on on that stage that day as opposed to a breakout it's just yeah. a completely different setup so I understand Brad's frustration I understand and love that he adapts his presentation on the fly based on the audience and what he's doing that's why he's been a successful speaker what do you say for 30 years I mean crazy that's yeah. amazing but as a planner, I don't want your laptop on my stage. I would tell you, you have to find another way. I would be willing to sacrifice a little bit of audience engagement because the aesthetic of the keynote stage and the backdrops, and it's the most photographed place in your conference. Usually yeah, many times that actually, is the most kind of there's not even a podium these days. A right? lot of times there's not even a podium. Exactly. So to your point, I think, as Brad was saying, if you do happen to be flexible to adapt your presentation on the fly, I think you should also be flexible to create your presentation in such a way during those keynote presentations where you might not need to have, I mean, I don't know his presentation. I'm just speaking, you know, totally general here. So would it be nice to have a link to, you know, some, some of his presentation to understand the elements and the graphics and the special sound effects or whatever it is that he needs yeah. that he feels like he needs for his you know point to be made come across well but if you are a keynote and you can be flexible enough to alter your presentation in a way that then the laptop can be and you can have multiple laptops you don't have to have one but if there's somebody that is qualified to run that ballroom that general session I'm pretty sure they can handle your presentation just the way you wanted to, assuming that you were able to do a bit of a tech check, like some kind of a rehearsal. Hey, I want this and this and this to be played this way at this queue, whatever. Like, or and do it the night before. Like, instructions. So like literally go slide by slide, queue by queue, yeah. and just tell them this is what I want. If you didn't get a chance to do your night before, because maybe you flew in the morning off, which if you're a keynote or a speaker, do not do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's always recipe for disasters. Every <laughs> time there's an issue with the keynote not showing up or being late is because their flight got delayed. Something happened because they were literally flying in the day up. Don't do that. Come in I mean, in the way air travel is these days, you don't want to be flying in the day of like, no, you, it's, never. It's too risky now. It's too risky now. Exactly. Plus, even as a speaker, like imagine the stress 
of you having to run from the airport and not even have time to take a shower, change, whatever, because maybe you didn't right. allocate enough time. Like that's exactly. not a good mental framing to be ready to give a talk that's engaging and positive and like, you know, empowering because you're just struggling to make it to the venue in time, you know? So just the other thing you mentioned, just sorry to interrupt was, you said my core issue is that my simple request, it may seem simple to Brad. I need my laptop at the podium on the stage with me. That is not an unreasonable request normally. However, yeah. when you're the keynote, it's again a different ballgame. So it may seem like a simple request to you to just move your laptop to the main stage, but there's so many connections and graphics and things that are happening outside of your, you know, one hour, 45 minute, however long keynote is, that that's really actually not a simple request. Like it seems like it to Brad, like, oh, I just need you to run a cord up here to hook up my laptop. Yeah. And in reality, it's just not that basic. And I mean, Megan, how many keynotes have you watched or, you know, previewed in your lifetime? Just curious. I wouldn't even know. From the top of the thousands, yeah, hundreds, so thousands, how many a lot? of them do they really need a laptop at the podium because their presentation is so convoluted that it cannot be run from the back of house. Because in my experience, I mean, most keynotes, they're empowering, they're, you know, elevating, they're like very like, they're not tactical. They're not the the workshop type of keynote that like, I love to be, you know, I'm not a keynote in that sense, but when I, when I'm a speaker as a, at a workshop, I love to be providing tactical, practical information. So that's why it's like a show and tell, right? Like that's where I have my laptop switching in between windows and all of that. As a keynote, you're not going to be switching in between laptops and windows and things like that, because that's not, in my opinion, the purpose of a keynote presentation, unless you've seen one that really goes in between like slides like crazy. I mean, there's definitely elements of, uh, you know, graphics and videos and sound and whatnot, but in most cases, all of that can be handled from a well put together presentation from the back of house, in my opinion, right. just from my experience running again, thousands of presentations back of house and seeing how those are run. So I'm very like intrigued by exactly what his keynote presentation looks like when he presents it that he requires, you know, his laptop always to be at the podium. Otherwise it kind of throws off his entire you know, topic per se. And to to give some context of why we're separating keynote from a breakout session, in a breakout, generally that goes typically, despite my painful heart saying this, typically a breakout session is one hour, even though they shouldn't be one hour, they're typically one hour, and then you have a break, and then you reset up for the next speaker. There's nothing that's stitched together pre and post. Maybe there's some walk-in slides. Maybe there's a, a video that's rolled for a sponsor or something. But typically, there's not a lot of speakers. It's one core speaker for one hour, and then there's break, and we reset yeah. for the next one. When you're on a keynote stage, you generally have a video and then your president or someone will come out an executive will come out and speak and then you might have a sponsor come out and speak and they have videos and all of these things are stitched together very very time to the minute so to then go from all of that stitched together to your keynote speaker and then go back to your executives or someone or an mc for that case All of the, there's multiple speakers, there's multiple videos, there's multiple graphics. There's so much that goes into that keynote stage beyond just the one keynote speaker. So that's why it's different because, and that's why typically you want a team sitting back of house running all of that. So it's a seamless flow from MC to executive back to MC to keynote, right? There's like all this, like it's a whole performance, like running the Grammys. Can you imagine the Grammys being like, hold on, sorry, this speaker wants to run their own presentation from their own laptop. 
was the whole award show. We're going to switch the equipment for them, they, right? They want to read their speech from the laptop at the front of the room. Oh, no. Let's, right. let's get this set up right now. No. Yeah. But you're totally right from an operational point of view behind the scenes. Like when we put together those uh, DAX slides, master DAX slides, it's, they are, they're containing multiple part presentations, one into right. each other, including, you know, the transitional elements, including the videos, so that it's an easy, you know, switch, 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 switch versus, oh, let me pause here, because what you don't want to see is the black screen of death on any of the screens while everybody is in the room looking at the stage. If you did that, you failed from an AV point of view. So nobody wants to see adapters switch on and off like screens and the window logo or the Mac logo on. No, none of that. Like that's why we have switchers. That's why we throw yeah. logos and you know, whatever logo slides that would avoid any of that messiness that, you know, mm -hmm you don't want to see, especially in a general session room, in a keynote room. So to your point, you're absolutely right. Like in most cases, that is rehearsed well in advance. Any changes are very much unflexible the morning of <laughs> because you've yep. already run through your cues and you're going to have, you know, music in, music out, all of those cues. You are not that willing anymore to want to make all those changes yeah. And if there's just a teleprompter. Up. There's a teleprompter that also has all of this in there. So like exactly the one simple change is not that simple because you have to change the flow. You've got to change all the teleprompters. You've got to change load in. Like it's yeah. just, it's not as simple as you think. And, you know, as much as we love Brad's very, very interactive presentation. And if it's the Brad Montgomery, I'm thinking of your sessions are incredibly dynamic and enjoyable, but as a keynote speaker, rehearse the day before, be flexible in how you present, because if you're on that keynote stage, the rules are different. It just is. I, I don't know how else to explain it other than it's just different. Yeah. And I mean, to what you just said, and if you're in a smaller room that is still considered keynote, right? Because they're smaller keynote rooms, they all vary in size and not all created equal, um, where there is some flexibility to where the laptop can be. And if you can have it at the podium, and even if it's at the podium, if you do not have your connections or your decimator in place, as you should be, bring it with you, go and yeah. get it from, <laughs> from Amazon, whatever you shop for AV stuff and get it B and H, whatever, and and have your tool of you know AV adapters with you at all times so that you don't run in any situations. I mean that that would be my first line of defense right there because like we're talking said, about John's toolkit now has flashlights in it. Brad's toolkit yeah. needs to have Mac adapters and switches Best and meters. whatever else yeah, he needs. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So make sure that you could you get yourself a couple of those just in case. And hopefully next time it's going to be a different situation and you're not going to have to be frustrated because I mean, I can't imagine starting your talk, you know, feeling like that anxiety, you know, building in or the frustration, you know, just lingering on the surface. To me, that just doesn't make for a good experience for yourself, but also for the audience, you know, and, and as he said, it doesn't want to come across as being difficult, but sometimes it's in our nonverbal communication <laughs> that can come right. across. And if you have a lot of anxiety that you carry now, you know, you're, you're, it's going to come across somehow. So those are our but Bravo to Brad for communicating all yes. of that because I can't tell you how many times the speaker has come in at the last second and has a Mac and hasn't told us or done something. So like, I don't want this all to be like a pile on Brad for his need at the computer at the stage, but Bravo for communicating it. The planner should be working with you to accommodate that and or give you notice ahead of time that they can or cannot accommodate that. So you shouldn't have headaches on the day of because yeah. communication wasn't there. So bravo for speaking up early, have it in your rider, work with the planners, and then just be flexible if they can't accommodate that, which I imagine is probably not that frequent. And always travel the day before. 
try to get that fact check the day before. Yeah. I mean, even if it's not on the schedule, like if you come before the next, you know, big meeting, in, in most cases, you're going to have a bit of a break somewhere, somehow. And if you can just come, you know, and talk to the AV leader, say, hey, I just want to check my presentation or whatever, because I want to make sure there's no issues. Nobody's going to say, no, you're not on the schedule. They're going to be flexible to, you know, because it's in their interest to make sure that you look good and nothing goes weary and wrong right so yeah the text um, in the room want to run through it with you like they don't want to mess it up either so if you exactly. get there they're going to be willing to sit down and go slide by slide and go walk through every single cue that you need what the music is or whatever like it's in their best interest to do it and they would exactly. rather do that than wait till the day of Absolutely. Nobody likes last minute panic attacks for sure. So uh, that goes on both sides of the conversation. Thank you so much, Brad, for sharing this story. I appreciate the fact that you were actually, you know, open to share like the good and the bad. <laughs> and it's you the know, first the speaker other. we heard from too. We've mostly been yeah. hearing from planners and AV folks and producers. So thanks for sharing, Brad. We love to hear the speaker perspective too. And do share a link. Um, to your presentation with us. I would love to actually see how, because I don't, I have not seen uh, Brad, you know, in uh, action. So if it's as good as Megan said, I definitely want to see, you know, a, a little preview of that. And kudos to you for sharing it and much success in, you know, in your career as um, you go forward and just be an awesome speaker. We need more of those. Yeah, we do. All right, second All right. story, here we go. This one takes okay. us in a different direction. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. To find out how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com. So I'll run point on this one. And our second story for today's episode comes from a meeting and event specialist with sales management and relationship development experience who faced a rather unexpected and chaotic situation once. At least it was just once. <laughs> Let's hope this only happened once. Yes. And it goes like this. In the middle of the night, a group of drunk hotel guests broke into the kitchen to try and cook something. Their attempts didn't go as planned, and they ended up setting off the fire alarm. This resulted in all of my attendees having to get up and evacuate the hotel in their PJs or whatever they were wearing. Thankfully, the drunk guests were not part of my group. However, it obviously created a huge disruption for the entire group. The key takeaway being this incident was, for the incidents was the importance of having some kind of a security team on site, day and night, apparently. So if your event can afford it, having security is a blessing for the event staff and greatly enhances the attendee experiences, especially if you're going to get woken up in the middle of the night in your unmentionables. I've been grateful to have this with several clients, especially for events with audiences that are more prone to unexpected behaviors. So with that, first thoughts. <laughs> well, thank God the drunk attendees that broke into the kitchen or the people who broke into the kitchen that were drunk were not her attendees. Thank God they weren't with her group. That saves a lot. I also don't disagree with having security team on site, but 24 hour security team seems excessive. Like, again, there's some things that just happen. You can't predict them or plan them. 
thankfully, because these weren't attendees, they were just other hotel guests that caused this. This is where I would rely on the hotel's security. Like they, the hotel or your venue where you're at, right. they're going to have 24 hour security. So on site visits, walkthroughs, in just pre-planning discussions, I would ask like, what are your support? security protocols do you have security at night what happens if there's a fire drill and everyone has to evacuate the hotel you know what are those and honestly share them with your attendees as well like they're probably not going to read them just like we don't read any of the safety information cards on airplanes right like but you've at least shared it you did your due yeah. diligence for the most part by sharing that like if there was an emergency to happen during the event post hours what happens i also can't imagine getting woken up in the middle of the night to evacuate a hotel in my pajamas and then seeing like all the other attendees, maybe my executives and like them seeing me in my pajamas, like, Oh, my gosh, that would be like the worst. Ass, the worst I can. I I mean, oh my gosh. Exactly. I, I'm just so, you know, in a way mindful because and confused because in most cases, hotels, at least the hotels that I've worked in, they lock the kitchen down. Like once yeah. the staff leaves the back corridors and the kitchen and all of those al alleys that go to, you know, where the behind the house staff is, it's usually locked down. So, I mean, she did say they broke into the kitchen. So like maybe they literally what? broke into the kitchen. Like, yeah. like that sounds crazy to me to begin with. I mean, they're drunk. So I guess they can be, you know, expected to do anything less eccentric, but they might have been really hungry too. Who knows? <laughs> Look, you've never been drunk. I have been drunk a lot. There are a lot of crazy things I've done when I was drunk. Never broken into a hotel kitchen though. Never well, had a desire. Because you're not that hungry. Who, who knows what would have happened if you would have like, you know, been drunk and hungry and in the middle of the night, I mean, that's Sounds usually how I end up ordering like $50 a Taco Bell. <laughs> That's usually what happens. But it's like I will they say something. They wanted to cook. Like what? <laughs> Those are healthy nuts. <laughs> they could have just grabbed okay something out of the ordering. fridge. No, yeah, they, they weren't. Could have. I will say the one thing, the other thing I took away from this, I've been grateful to have this with several clients, especially for events mm -hmm. with audiences prone to unexpected behavior. I think this also goes very much to knowing your audience and knowing your attendees. If you know your group is rowdy, for example, I, I don't know if you've watched the docu-series on the creation of Uber and them talking about all the crazy parties that they threw. If you know your group is crazy, and is going to be destructive or has a tendency to do things like break into hotel kitchens in the middle of the night to cook themselves food. Yeah. Then maybe you do need 24 hour security at the hotel to monitor your guests. And that needs to just be part of your budget. So I think it also goes like an executive retreat. That's all C-suites. I don't know. I've seen some crazy stuff happen at those too, but generally they're going to be not as rowdy as maybe a consumer show or even man i've done some anime shows in my career that got a little crazy in the evenings and we then after the first year we learned our lesson and hired more security the next year till three o'clock in the morning because people got crazy and yeah. you just have to know your audience and know their behavior to know where to draw the line at like security but I'm curious in this situation because, you know, if a said drunk hotel guests were not under the purview of this particular event, I'm wondering in this situation, because now you disturb the entire hotel and the guests, and maybe you were the only event that was happening in that hotel. We don't know. Um, what are some, some of the, you know, paybacks the hotel should, you know, to compensate for such behavior and disturbing, you know, a fine audience that was going to sleep and waking up for their keynote speaker in the morning. But now they're all like, you know, drowsy and sleepy because they were up in the middle of the night in their PJs trying to figure out what the heck just happened. I mean, I'm always in favor of kind of like leaning into the incident like this, like maybe everyone gets a free coffee in the morning or instead of just your Nobody coffee bar. requires more than a free coffee. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, maybe so, but like, just trying to think like something kitschy, like we know you lost some sleep last night. So like, here's an extra amenity in your room or they have a latte bar. Maybe you get discounts at the spot. I don't know if like a full treatment for everyone in the conference, like the planner definitely should get like a spa treatment for having the headache of all this. The stress. Yeah. Totally. But for your attendees that are at the event that maybe got, you know, disturbed by having to be up in the middle of the night with this, you know, apologize. Like maybe the general manager comes on before the keynote speaker to apologize for what happened and then announce like, you know, we're sending an amenity to everyone's room or the latte bar, the afternoon break got enhanced in some way, you know, maybe espresso beans, like again, like be kitschy and kind of lean into it. I think the worst thing the venue could do in this situation is not address it at all and leave it on the meeting planner to have to deal with the attendees. It's not the planner's fault. It's not the group's fault. It's not the company's fault. And so the hotel or venue, whatever it is, needs to be the one addressing the attendees and doing something about it. Yeah. Sweeping it under the rug is just non-negotiable in my book. You just like, you have to do something or say something. And then there's something to be said about those drunk guests. They had to come from somewhere. Were they coming from the bar downstairs? And if so, was there no you know, supervision as to how drunk were they allowed to get to get to the point where now they're kind of you know, running havoc everywhere? So yeah, did they get overserved? Of- yeah, like they get overserved. Was it no, you know, a bit of a, you know, hey, uh, you had one too many drinks. Thank you, sir. Now go to sleep. <laughs> this is about the end of the service for you tonight, you know. So we don't know a lot of those elements and we don't know a lot of the details. Obviously, it still makes for a great story to tell afterwards, oh, of for sure. But I'm sure in the, in the middle of it probably wasn't all that great. And I mean, also, we don't know if it's the middle of the summer or in the middle of the winter. Like getting out of your hotel room in the middle of the winter in the PJs is completely different than doing the same thing in, you know, during a summer month. So there's a totally. lot to be said. Or, you know, if this was Paris and it was not pouring rain. <laughs> I mean, it now makes me think about what pajamas I'm packing before I go on show site in case I actually, I'm not going to wear the same maybe gross 10-year-old pair of pajamas at my house. Like, I'm probably going to pack something a little nicer now in case we have to get evacuated. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, what was it? There was an event. It was so much fun that, oh, yeah, um, we were doing a... uh, a wellness retreat on a cruise and one of the nights they had a pajama night and this was the kind of night where you really brought your best pajamas to go to the club because literally it was a pajama night right so that's the kind of pj i'm thinking you should pack if this was to happen again like the button-up shirt like maybe it has a little monogram on it like this everybody looks so fine in their pajamas i'm like how practical is this right yeah, not the like, you know, boxer shorts and t-shirts that you probably normally would sleep exactly. in. Exactly. Probably going to pass a little nicer from now on. But it definitely makes you wonder, okay, so next time I probably need to know, like, or maybe even have some cover up, like, what if you're not wearing pajamas and you're just the kind of like, you know, this is my me and my covering, so do bed. That's all. Like, what are you doing? Grab the bathrobe <laughs> as you're evacuating out the door. Grab that bathrobe and put it on because nobody wants to see you in your pajamas. Exactly, exactly. So, I'm, I mean, lots to think about in case of any of the situation. It kind of goes, you know, uh, hand in hand a little bit with that emergency that you mentioned that John had with three days without uh, power, right? So it's almost like you always have to think about, like, okay, so if something were to happen, (laughs) how would that situation find me? Would I be prepared or would I be scrambling? And I mean, you can avoid all unexpected situations for sure, but a bit of forethought, it's nice to think about some of those things, you know? Now, can you think about all situations? Probably not. And would you expect, you know, a group of drunk guests to, you know, try to break into the kitchen and then or steal a the table. hotel on fire or steal a table <laughs> or whatever? Probably not. But I mean, all of the stories, it kind of starts like making you think, oh, I have not think about all those things. So maybe I should. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of this whole series of like, 
I never would have thought that someone might break into the kitchen in the middle of the night and set it on fire. I never would have expected to be without power for four days. And so it's kind of back to the origin of why we started this in the first place is because you can't think of everything. It's just exactly. not We're possible. Like, lock down your tables. Make sure exactly. that they're bolted. <laughs> right. And so just even highlighting these, like thinking about like, I never would have thought to put a flashlight in and my event toolkit that I go on site with, but now there's a flashlight in it, right? So it's just highlighting some of these like crazy quirky stories that happen that never ever in a million years could we predict would happen so that we can all kind of learn and be better for them because man, I've never had to be evacuated in the middle of the night in my pajamas, but now I'm going to be going to bed dressed a little bit differently than I exactly. Know. And pack some protein bars in case you get hungry in the middle of the night, so you don't end up having to break into the kitchen <laughs> to cook yourself a snacks meal. on snacks. I always have snacks. <laughs> you never know. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, I love that we got to talk a little bit about this too. Obviously, a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of suppositions happening and assumptions, but. Still, it, it's fun to, you know, imagine yourself in those, in somebody's shoes, having to, you know, deal with the situation and then for figure sure. out, okay, what would I do in this uh, situation? So for sure, yeah. PJs, better looking PJs, if anything, if it's a, a PJ runaway show, might as well, you know, <laughs> present well. <laughs> might as well. When you look good, you feel good. That's right. That's right. Maybe you will sleep better for that, for that reason Maybe. alone. Well, with that, I think that kind of wraps our uh, episode uh, of event about it this time around. And um, I wanted to extend our heartfelt thanks to everyone that contributed to the show with their stories. We are still welcoming submissions. So if you want to submit your story, again, it can totally be very uh, anonymous as this one story was, or it can be straight up, you know, presenting all the facts like Brad's story was. We are uh, welcoming your experiences and we love discussing about them. <laughs> and we try to do it justice as much as we can. We'll do it justice, okay? Yes, we okay. might be a little bit probably exaggerating in our reactions because we don't know all the facts, but we just know what you share and we welcome that. And I hope you do find a little bit of, you know, the uh, silver lining and the funniness and, and the whole thing. So keep sharing those stories, war, heroes, whatever they might be. We look forward to featuring them in our upcoming episodes. And with that, also, I want to ask a favor. Please do me a favor and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube or uh, Spotify. I also get the analytics. And here's the thing. There's only a certain percentage of you that have done so. And I would love for more of you to do it and show your support that way as well. We are also uh, showcasing some of those uh, episodes on LinkedIn. If you're more of a LinkedIn person, uh, there's lots of snippets on Instagram. If that's where your playground is. And with that, thank you also to Fun Events for all the behind the scenes production to our podcasting partner, Kitcaster, for their support in bringing amazing guests forth. And that's all I had to say. Megan, any last thoughts? No, just excited to hear more stories. Please send them in. Even if they're in the chat on LinkedIn, we were looking at the comments from every episode too. So if you don't use the form, we're monitoring all of it. We want to hear these stories and get them out there because learning is fun and edutain edutainment, as I'm calling it these days. And we just want to share more and more. No more hiding behind the curtain. We all learn when we're sharing. Should we also reveal the big news? Yes. All right. We okay. just got so, really exciting news about event about it. We did. So if you're an event professional that has heard about IMAX, and if you're not an event professional and have not heard about IMAX, you should look it up. I-M-E-X is a wonderful show. International, International Meeting Exchange exchange okay so it happens in las vegas in the us and it happens in europe once a year and it was in frankfurt i was there last year it was fantastic and oh, we yes and we are going to present event about it on the imax stage and so just a little episode stories. of an in-person live episode of Event About It at IMAX. I'm so excited. It's going to be so excited. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a wonderful panel 
me, Megan, and then we're going to welcome from the audience a stand-in panelist that we don't know who that is, but we're going to look forward to meeting them. And we're going to discuss some of those stories, and it's going to be all in person. This is where we give hugs and we get to shake hands <laughs> and kiss babies, all the things. So super excited. Yeah. We just got the approval for this session and it's going to be Wednesday, October 9th. So if you're going to IMAX, you're going to have to join us because we're going to keep talking about it. I'm going to make a big noise about it. So make sure that you put it on the schedule because we are coming. Live podcast from IMAX. <laughs> so excited. <laughs> So excited. Well, until then, how about we look forward to seeing you in our next episode. So stay inspired, keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible in event planning, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Events Demystified podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to review it, rate it, and share it with other event professionals that could benefit from it. Connect with us on social at Events Demystified Podcast. We would love to hear from you and what you're up to. If you'd like to learn more about free fan event services and find out if we're a good fit in supporting your event, can we help your event be successful with a 20-minute free consultation? Link in the episode's notes. Thanks for tuning in.